Welcome to the Art of Exploitation course, one of the most important topic in the Certified Ethical Hacker curriculum. Hello, my name is Mohamed Atif. I am an Information Security Consultant, Senior Penetration Tester, and Easy Council Certified Instructor. I have more than 20 years of experience in information security and penetration, tester, uh, penetration testing projects. With more than 16 courses published in different platforms, most of them are best-selling courses, and more than 40,000 students enrolled in those courses. I'm proud to say that I help many students to get the ethical hacking skills, uh, pass the CH exam from the first attempt and get certified and start their career in penetration testing and ethical hacking. Our Art of Exploitation course will cover the following topics. First, we're going to talk about vulnerabilities or weakness, how to identify vulnerable computers and vulnerable uh, system. Then we're going to talk about exploitation, how to use and exploit to hack a system through a vulnerability. Then we're going to cover the power over buffer overflow from scratch, so you'll understand one of the most sophisticated attack. And finally, we're going to cover how to work with scripts. After the course completion, you will be able to create your own script and hack any system that is vulnerable. In a previous video or a previous section, we spoke about social engineering and how to compromise the system, but based on people error. So I was able to get full access to a system or to capture their credential, but this was based on their error. So I was hoping that they could they click on the link I sent or open an attachment that I sent and accordingly I can get access to the sheet. It's very effective, except still we are depending on something or on someone. What if this someone is very careful? He never click on a link. He never open a suspicion attachment. So I will not be able to access uh, his computer. Now, what we'll be focusing about on this section is how to identify weakness inside the system and use such weakness to uh, compromise the system. So for instance, my victim has Windows XP or Windows 7 or Windows 8 or Windows Server. I can check for what weakness does this operating system have and try to gain access to the system or compromise the system according to those weakness. And by doing that, I'm not depending on anyone because I'm not just looking for weakness inside the platform or operating system. I'm going to check what software do he have, what port he got open, what service he got. And I start looking for weakness in those service. This maybe seem complicated, but actually is not complicated at all. It's quite, it's very, very easy. So during this section, I'm going to show you how we used to do that first, which was, which was kind of hard, looking for a vulnerability and usual, uh, vulnerability and looking for its exploit, and uh, try to exploit this vulnerability. And usually, you, you, we get this pro exploit written by a different language like C or Perl or Python, and I have to do some modification. And it was hard if you don't have any kind of like uh, development background. It will not be that easy, but some framework has been introduced and made that very easy for anyone. So we don't have any pre-requests. You can just use these tools and you can search for vulnerability, choose what uh, vulnerability and exploit and exploit the system. But the main point on this section is that we do not depend on the victim. I will ex exploit and compromise the system and I don't depend on any uh, user or uh, uh, any kind of mistake. So it doesn't matter how careful he is, I'm going to compromise the system anywhere. 
Now let me just identify two definitions here. What is a vulnerability and what is an exploit? A vulnerability is a weakness, while an exploit is a program that you can use to hack the system through this weakness. So you may have a vulnerability that doesn't have an exploit. So you can have an open port, but no services on, on this open port. So I cannot hack to this. So it's still a vulnerability, but it doesn't have an exploit. So on the next video, we're going to start the hard way first. And then after that, we're going to show you the easy way which actually it's quite easy. And I'm going to find you different, I'm going to uh, explain to you different techniques that can be used to compromise the system according to their weakness. So let's start and see. So let's take a real life scenario related to vulnerability and exploit. So I'm going to assume that I have my victim machine here. Okay. And my objective is to compromise this machine, but based on the vulnerability or the weakness of this system, the weakness in the platforms that they are using, the weakness in any applications, the weakness in the port, any weakness, and I'm going to try to look for an exploit for this weakness and get access. So I'm assuming that you did your homework and you start, you did uh, start by scanning the system and you are already aware that this victim has a Windows XP machine. So the next step that I need to search for what vulnerability and what weakness has a Windows XP. And I can do the same for whatever information I have about this machine. So if I know that they have a specific version of Acrobat Reader, I can search for Acrobat Reader uh, 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 weakness, vulnerability. If I know that they are using Microsoft Office on a, spe a specific version of that, I can search for that. Where I can search, actually, there is many websites that will help you uh, uh, looking for such vulnerability. So, for instance, we have one of the very popular websites called securityfocus.com. And when you go to Security Focus, they will show you the latest vulnerability that has been discovered. But if you go down here and you can search for all vulnerability. So, I can click here and I can start looking for what exactly I'm looking for. So, for instance, if I'm looking for Microsoft, I'm going to click on the first drop list. And you're going to find a huge amount of product. So, you know, whatever you are looking for, you're going to find some weakness and vulnerability here. It could be a platform like Windows or Linux. It could be an equipment like Cisco or HP or Citrix. It could be an appliance or software. So anything that you are looking for, you're going to find it inside this list. So let's search for Microsoft. And when you choose Microsoft, on the second drop-down menu, it will give you all product. So you are looking for a weakness in Microsoft. What, what Microsoft product? We have a lot of product. I don't think I choose the right one. So no, no this, is, this is not... Uh, sorry. So... Sorry. So when you choose Microsoft on the second drop-down menu, you will find all Microsoft products. So we click here and we choose anything. So for instance, let's take Windows uh, XP or Windows 7 or uh, Windows Server. So all Microsoft Windows will show here. And we're going to choose in our case Microsoft XP. And when you click on the second menu, if XP has different service back, you will find on the third menu the different kind of service back. So if I choose, for instance, you know, if I keep it this way, it will give all service back problem. So you can see that we have a huge amount of vulnerability. And actually, we have around a 12 page fill of vulnerability. Now let's click on any one of those and let's see exactly what we're going to find here. So if you are looking here, you're going to find on the first page, if you click on the one of the link, 
it will give you a brief about this vulnerability and then a discussion discussion will show you will explain to you this vulnerability will lead to what will lead to a code execution so someone can execute code remotely it will lead to a denial of service it will lead to so you have an example and here you're going to find and this is the interesting part the exploit and do you remember we define the exploit as the program used to hack to the system through this vulnerability so sometimes they said we don't have an exploit for that and sometimes you're going to find exploit and then the solution and sometimes you're going to say there is a service back or a patch and sometimes you're going to say we don't have any solution yet and some reference okay another website that also gives this kind of information it's called exploit hyphen db so exploit db it's a website yeah it's blocked here let me show it to you how it look like uh, it will do the same except it's it's more as an underground website not a professional the security focus it's a professional website so this site it look like this exploit db where you have all the exploit and is what kind of like uh, effect they are doing can they be used remotely or locally and so on and you can download the exploit so the only problem that you're gonna face is that the exploit most of the time it's a program written with different language with C language with Perl language with Python language so unless you have some experience with that because most of the time you're going to need to modify inside the exploit to be able to fit to the vector. So if you don't have that much of experience, this used to be a problem. Now it's not anymore. After we're going to explain the meta exploit on the upcoming video, you're going to see that you don't need any kind of language experience. But I wanted to show you how we use things before because you may need to learn a little bit about that especially when this when we start talking about the buffer overflow so on next video we're going to go through a specific vulnerability and exploit and i'm going to show you how we used to hack a system using this vulnerability and then we're going to do that with an automated tools <clears throat> So getting back to our scenario from the previous video, from the previous video, I have a vector machine. They have Windows XP. I start searching from different websites that we used in the previous video, and I search for what problem Windows XP have, and I was able to go and find in uh, security focus this specific vulnerability. You remember that we have 12 pages filled of vulnerability, but I'm going to choose one that was very, very common in Windows XP and Windows Server 2003. That's why Microsoft stopped supporting them, because it was a very common pro uh, vulnerability that allow you to access any Windows XP right away. The vulnerability name is called DCOM Exploit or DCOM RPC. Now, RPC is a service inside Windows, and uh, they find the vulnerability that can be used to compromise the system so if you go there and you go to the exploit part you're going to find that they are giving you the exploit but they are written in c so if you open this exploit for instance you're going to see that this is a c code so i downloaded this exploit inside my hacker machine just to test it and let's log into this machine and let me show you how it works and let me remind you one more time that this is the hard way i mean later on this section you're going to see that you know you don't need go you don't, you don't need to go through all of that it can be done automated but you need to understand and this is what is this course is all about to understand the technique not the tools so i did download this exploit and uh, I put them the exploit inside the folder on my C drive under the name of DCOM exploit and this was the exploit now the problem is you cannot use this exploit this way you have to compile it okay 
So we don't need to go through how to compile exploit, you know, this is our, out of our scope. But eventually, I need to have an executable file, which is this one. Now, if I go and try to run this one, okay, if I go to this specific pass from my command prompt, cd dcom exploit, and then dcom exploit, and I type enter, he said, okay, this is not the right way to use this exploit. This is how it needs to be used. You, run, you type dcom exploit, then the target ID, then the target IP. Now let's check the target IP first. So let me go to my victim machine and let's see the IP. And uh, I want to remind you that uh, through the reconnaissance phase, I explained to you how easy it is to get the IP for anyone remotely or locally. So I uh, just need to get the IP here, 192.168.95.150, and this is fine, but what is the target ID? So I know the target IP, but I don't know what is exactly, so he gave me a list. Okay, target ID, if it's Windows Server, this will be the target ID, if it's XP, the, so he, this part has been given from his side, and this part you should have uh, know it. So I'm going to rewrite the comment. And then, in my case, my target ID is 5 because it was in this XP service back 0. And the IP of my machine, the vector machine, is 192.168.50. I'm sorry, 9595.150. And we click on Enter. And what this tool used to do, it was just opening a port remotely. I mean, one, once you launch this one, it will go to the victim machine and open a port 4.4. And we can verify that the exploit was successful. If we go here and we open the command prompt. And do you remember how to check the port, the open port? Net state minus an. You should find port 44 open so uh, it's a huge amount of port but you should find 44 open and let's see 44 yeah here you go so he already success to open a port on remotely on the victim machine so any, compu any computer has Windows XP, we used to use these tools just to run the exploit and it will open a port on this machine. Now, what should I do with the port? I mean, yeah, it opened a port. How can I connect to a port, to an open port? Actually, there is a tool that I want you to introduce to. I want to introduce uh, the tool for you. And it's very, very handy. And we used to call that the Hacker Swiss Army, that we use that all the time. It's called Netcat or NC. And it's built in inside Linux, but you know, you can download the uh, uh, Windows copy. And this uh, tool, it's used for many, like utility, or it's used for many uh, functions. But one of the functions is to connect to a remote port. So if I know that my victim machine has a port 44 open, I can use Netcat to connect to that. So I can type NC and the computer IP, the victim computer IP, dot 95 dot 150 and then space and the port number. So if the port is open, I'll be connecting to this machine. Three, four. And we click on enter. And yes, here you go. Now we are on the victim machine. And if you want to check, if I type IP config, I can see that I am on the victim machine. So let me just like create a folder or something. Uh, make dire hacked one, two, three. I think the command is not right. It's uh, MD, sorry. MD hacked. MD stands for make directory. One, two, three. Oh, it already exists. So hacked X Y Z, and if we go to the vector machine, 
we can see that there is a folder under this name on the C drive. So the point is, I was able to hack to a system, but not depending on the, uh, I'm not depending on the victim behavior or his awareness. No, I found a weakness. This is hacked uh, XYZ. I find the weakness and I was able to hack to the system through this weakness. So this is actually my objective. But the point is, it was not easy before. So you saw, we went through some process and I even brief the steps. I told you we need to download the exploit and compile it. And sometimes you need to do modification. Maybe this specific exploit didn't request any modification, but some of them, you have to open the exploit and you have to change inside the exploit. So they will match the uh, uh, victim machine. So this was kind of complicated because exploit used to be written in different language. So it was not that easy. So this specific vulnerability was related to a service called RPC that it's by default installed on the system and it's up and running. If you open your windows and you check inside services, you will find a service called RPC where you can check this RPC problem. And it was, they find, the, they find a program that can exploit this one. It stands for remote procedures call. This is the one. So it's something that comes with the windows and you cannot disable because if it disable, it will affect other service. And because this specific vulnerability and exploit was very, very common a few years back, uh, they created a graphical program to use it. So uh, it was a nice program. And uh, let me know if you want it. I can share it with you. So it's called the RPC GUI. It, quite, quite, it was a very easy program to use. So it allowed you to compromise any uh, Windows XP or Server 2003 uh, application. Just write the IP here and click on exploit and that's it. You are on it. On the next video, I'm going to show you a framework called Metasploit. And Metasploit allows you to do that automatic. You don't have to search. It's just a framework. It collects all the vulnerability and exploit. And you have to select what exploit you are looking for. You put the IP of the victim, and you'll get access right away. So you don't have to go through all those uh, uh, steps. And, uh, you know, if the exploit is... Uh, uh, written with C or Perl, it doesn't make a difference. He will compile that and he's just going to allow you to use it. So in the next video, I'm going to show you the Metasploit, uh, Metasploit framework that was used to standardize this kind of attacks. In the previous video, we went through how to find vulnerability in a system. And I didn't meant by that only operating system uh, vulnerability, Windows or Linux or Mac or whatever. I meant any applications that run on the victim machine. So I can search, search for vulnerability in Acrobat Reader, in Microsoft Office, in any application. And we saw that it was not an easy process before. So we have to search for, for the vulnerability and search for an exploit and then see if the exploit can be used right away or it needs to be compiled and compile it and then see what will be the next process. Now, we used to do that before, but a few years back, actually a long time, there was a project called Metasploit. And Metasploit, it's an automated tool for using the exploit, exploitation. So it take all the exploits that we know from different websites like Security Focus, Exploit DB, Security Tracker, and it allow us to use the exploit right away without bothering ourselves in the compiling and the using. It's just a wizard to use the exploit. So let's take the same exploit and how to use it using Metasploit. So I'm going to use the GTrack Windows, and I'm going to go here to the GTrack. And inside the 
penetration, you're going to find the framework 2 and 3. Uh, they are two different, and you can use Metasploit in command line, which you're going to be using later on, or uh, GUI or web. But I'm going to use uh, uh, like uh, as a proof of concept to the web because it's very easy to use. So let's take the framework 2, Metasploit web-based. And once I run this program, he's going to ask me to open a browser and type this specific URL. So I'm going to open the browser. I'm going to open Firefox Internet and Firefox and write down this IP with this port, which is uh, 127 uh, 7, uh, dot zero dot zero dot one a colon five five one two three four five. And he's going to open for us the web-based Metasploit. And he's going to show us, you know, some of those uh, vulnerability. And I can even, uh, some of the exploit, I can even filter. Instead of searching, I can ask him, I'm looking for uh, exploits that can run on an operating system. For instance, Windows XP. Oh, sorry. Windows XP. And he's going to, like, show us everything that can be used on Windows XP. So I'll choose this one and filter. Uh, let's take the same vulnerability because we, we we assume that you already know what you are looking for. So you remember it was Microsoft RPC.com. Let's get down Microsoft RPC.com. This is the one. And he's going to give us a brief about this vulnerability and some reference. And he said, okay, I can run this one on those specific operating system. I'm going to say, yes, it's one of those. And he's going to ask us, what payload would you like to add? And this is different than the previous scenario. That on the previous scenario, I just was able to get a bind shell on the hacker uh, vector machine. But here I can create an account. I can get a meta-preterization. I can get... So I'm going to choose something different. I'm going to choose the bind VNC inject, which will give us a graphical uh, session on the vector machine. And he's going to say, okay, I need some information. I need the victim IP. So I'm going to use the victim IP, which is 192.168.95.150. Let me check on the victim machine that this is their IP. So I go here and uh, yes. Okay. And... <clears throat> that's it he gonna open port he gonna connect he gonna give us a bind vnc inject fine exploit and i'm gonna click on exploit and we'll see he said yes i open a session i click on the session and see what we get are going to have we're gonna have the graphical interface so i have full access graphically on the vector machine and if you check here as the title it's a full access so i have full access on his machine so this was a different way for using the exploit, but much more easier way. And in the upcoming video, it gets easier and easier. So now working with vulnerability and exploit, it's much more easier than before. So I hope it was useful, and I want you to keep practicing that in different way on your own lab. And let me know uh, if you have any problem or you need any kind of assistance. Thank you. In this video, we're going to see how to use Metasploit in an automated way. So instead of scanning ourselves and uh, getting some information and looking for how vulnerable is the system is and searching for some exploits that can be used for such vulnerability and so on. Metasploit can do that on behalf of us. So we're just going to specify a machine and he will do all the process for us. He's going to scan, he's going to get some information, he's going to check inside the vulnerability database and he's going to check inside the exploit database. And if he finds any, he will try to exploit that and give us a meta preterization right away. So he's doing everything on behalf of us. So it's a very, very nice automated tools. So let's try that.
our victim will be this machine, Windows XP machine, with the IP of 192.168.95.150. And then we're going to go to GTrack Linux. You can use any of the Linux edition, Backtrack or Kali Linux or GTrack. The tool exists everywhere except it could be in different location. So we're going to go here and we're going to go to the application menu uh, inside the services and we're going to choose fast track and you can you have different option to run this fast track tools except I prefer to use the interactive tools so interactive tool is just giving you a menu and you just reply back to the question usually when you are using the interactive tool it's better to start with the first two options which is updating the fast, uh, fast track and updating the auto pawn but since they may take some time to do that, I'm going to just use the versions, existing versions that, I'm, that I have right now. But for yourself, it's better to update so you'll be having all new vulnerabilities and all new exploited. Then uh, we're going to start the auto pawn automation. So number two. And in this case, he's going to ask us about... <clears throat> Uh, what IP would you like to scan? You can put an IP like uh, the first one or you can put a network like the last option where you can put 198.168.1.1 slash 24 that means everything inside this network should be .1.1 or .1.2 or 3 or 4 so I can scan a full network definitely it will take longer time but uh, in our case we're going to scan just one machine which is 192.1 168.95.150 which is the victim machine click on ok then and this is actually very important you're gonna ask for what kind of session would you like to have would you like to have a bind session or a reverse session now bind session means that your computer will connect to the victim computer while reverse session means the victim computer will be connected to this computer. And the second option is very important because it will bypass the firewall. Usually firewall validate any traffic coming from any computer to the local computer. But usually it's not that specific when it comes to traffic going from the local computer to outside. So usually traffic going from the machine to outside, it's not uh, inspected well. While the traffic coming from outside to the local machine, this usually is impacted well. So it's much more better to use reverse session to bypass the firewall. Click on enter. And that's it. You can do everything on behalf of us. It may take a few seconds or a couple of minutes because I don't have that much of vulnerability and exploit because I didn't update it. But it will go and do everything and I can monitor that while he's doing so you're going to notice that you're going to start uh, end mapping and here you go he was able to get all the ports and all the service and the operating system and he's going to start searching all the exploit that can be used for those specific information so in my case he was able to get uh, around uh, it's not clear here how many exploit he, he found but yeah 153 so he according to the result of scanning and map scanning he finds that the system can be exploited with one of those or the, the one applicable is 153 exploit so he's trying one by one some of them will not be working some of them will be working so as you can see we have now zero sessions, that means none of them so far, 61 from 153 is not, uh, was not able to, uh, to hack to the victim machine. I just need to be patient and uh, eventually, you know, he will be able to connect with one or two or even more sessions. Mm. It's a very nice tool to use in case uh, if your customer has a lot of uh, like uh, vulnerable machine, Windows XP or Windows Server 2003. And instead of doing everything manually, you can start with that and 
see how effective it is because if you get access to one machine as you're going to see later on this course just getting or just compromise one machine you can compromise all the remaining machines so if one machine is weak inside your network this is what exactly you need you just hack to this machine and from this weak machine using some techniques that we're going to see by the end of this course you'll be able to hack to all other machines it doesn't seem that he found anything so uh, we may need to repeat that one more time <clears throat> sometimes it shows a session by the end of the all the exploitation so let's we see and check and see if uh, and let me validate or verify the victim machine if I use the correct IP or not yes <clears throat> doesn't look good so we may need to try it one more time just let's give him like five seconds more yep he got one so you just need to be patient a little bit okay so one session was found okay and I don't have to wait one will be enough he can find more and connect with more but if we just break that we can see that we already have a session on this victim machine and what kind of station a metapreter station which is a the most dangerous one so if we type session minus i sorry stations minus i you're going to see that there is one station now with the victim and it's a metapreter session and we explained the metapreter session in previous video but uh, let me switch to the session session minus i number one and you can type help and you have full access on the machine so you can do whatever you want you can open the cam the mic download file upload file execute comment we explained that in social engineering and the exploitation on previous video so i didn't i don't need to go through it again my objective of this video to show you that there is some automated tools uh, especially this fast track that can do everything on behalf of you it's a handy one that I can start with instead of starting very deeply at the beginning of a penetration testing project. I can start with, uh, start with one of these tools, especially that it can scan a range of IP, not just one machine by machine. I can give him a network and he will scan all the machine inside this network and he will be able to find one machine, not just to find the machine, but also to compromise the machine and give me access to the machine right away so this is the fast track you can test it and you can try it and uh, get familiar with it because it's a it's a very handy tool as well thank you on the previous video we explained how to use an automated tool from fast track it's called the, uh, uh, from metasploit it's called the fast track and we saw that everything can be done automated and i just need to specify the ip he will scan and he will search for vulnerability and exploit and compromise the system and give me a meta pattern session we have a similar tool that can do that except in a graphical way and some people are using you know, prefer to use a graphical way and actually it's a, it's a it's a very effective tool i mean it's much more than what we're going to explain in this video so you can discover these tools yourself it's a very powerful one so it will do the same like previous video automate the process except it's a graphical tool this tool's name is armitage so let's open the tool so if you go here to the uh, G track and uh, penetration testing you're gonna find the Armitage Metasploit framework 
Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start the tools. <clears throat> and while it starts, let me log into my victim machine. It's logged in. Let me just check the IP of my victim machine. Okay. Let's get back to our machine. You get this connection windows. Click on connect. <clears throat> and okay. And he gonna start the Metasploit framework. The Armitage Metasploit framework. As you can see by when you start you don't have anything inside. So we're gonna start by going to host. host and we go to add host and here I can write one computer or more than one or even a network so in my case I can write down 192.168.95.150 and I can add more or I can even write zero so he will add the full network so I'm going to click on OK you can add this machine as you can see since it has a black screen that's mean no information is available about this machine yet so after doing that I'm gonna go to host one more time and go to nmap scan and choose intensive scans the first one and I'm gonna spy specify the machine one more time 192.168.95.150 five zero and we click on okay it will take few seconds because you can scan the system and try to gather as much information about the system and how I'll be knowing that information has been available you should so you should see a logo showing on the uh, monitor uh, with the specific operating system so if it's a Windows 2000 2003 XP 7 you will be able to find out what operating system uh, they have. So just give him a few seconds and I believe eventually uh, you will get the uh, information about this machine. This includes the ports, the service, the operating system, everything. Nothing will help showing exactly what is running now. So, I don't know, should I rescan it one more time? And map scan, intensive scan 192.168.95.50. And Okay. We just need to be patient. Okay. And if you even add more machine, this process will take longer time. But let's wait. While it's scanned, let's, uh, let's uh, ch check something. If you right click here on this machine, you will only find two options here host and services so this is the only option available at the beginning because those options will change in a few seconds If I should pause the video until it finish, so because it usually take like yeah, it's done. So scan completed, and as you see that the monitor uh, changed and now it show what kind of operating system you have on the system. So the intensive scan was able to collect some information about this victim, and he's showing us such information. Okay. Now, once we get that, not only the operating system, but the port and the service and everything, the second or the third step is to go to attack and ask him to find attack. 
by port and by vulnerability. So I'm asking, check the port, what port they have, what service they have on those ports. Are those vulnerable? Can those be exploited? And we repeat the same step by vulnerability. Check the weakness, check the operating system and everything. And it was fast actually, he checked and he gave us that he checked by port and by vulnerability. And now all the exploits that can be used to uh, compromise the system for their vulnerability are there. You just need to right click and now you're going to find the new menus called attack where all the vulnerability and exploit has been listed here. So let's try one. So we're going to take dcom, this one, and he's going to just confirm the target and the IP and what will be exp what would be, what will be uh, uh, exposed, uh, exploited, and everything. And I don't have to change anything. I just click on launch, and let's see if this exploit success. The monitor should change to a exactly to a red frame. That means this computer has been compromised, and now you have full access to it. And I just can right click on it, and I can go to the interpreter here, and all the interpreter options are here. So uh, you know access. You can go to exploit, for instance, and ask him to browse the file, and it will browse down here all the file on this machine. I can specify a pass. Show me the file on the C drive. So he will show me the file on the feed, uh, C drive. And everything is inside the interpreter session, but instead of using a command line, you know, it exists here. So this is another way for automate the Metasploit framework, but in a graphical interface. And it's quite easy to use. And as I told, to, told you, Armitage is a quite interesting program that has a lot of feature not just this one but it's it's a big program it's not a small one so that's everything related to this video and see you next video thank you so much In this section, we are going through a very important topic. We are going to explain buffer overflow. And this is one of the very advanced and technical topic in penetration testing. And if you give some attention to this section and you do a lot of practicing, you're going to add to yourself some very good skills when it comes to penetration testing. Because most of the vulnerabilities that they found right now and most of the exploitation are related to buffer overflow. And you'll be able to do that yourself. You'll be able to create your own exploit. So it's a very, very important topic. And it will also uh, uh, add to you uh, some skills like how to verify or how to uh, work with memory. You're going to understand more the memory structure and where is data is saved and how it works and where is the critical area in memory. Let me start by explaining what is buffer overflow. Now, I'm going to start by a specific program. Buffer overflow, it's a weakness inside the application that allow user to get advantage of the memory. So, for instance, if we are using an application like calculator and you write down any number here, so uh, you write down like a number like this, and you place on plus sign, where this number will be saved? Will it be saved on the hard drive? No, it will not. It will be saved inside your memory in a place called variable. And this will, it's a predefined location. Uh, so the programmer who created the calculator did identify some location in memory with a specific size and allow user to save information. So if you like click on plus and you put like 66, this will be saved in another location. And then you click on equal, so he will take the amount on the first variable and add it to the amount of the second variable and give you the value. So my point is, whatever you are writing on the calculator, this will be saved inside memory, not on your hard drive. Now, those places which we refer to as variables, those has been predefined while creating the calculator application. And those 
actually have a specific size. So whoever creates a calculator application did identify a size. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, it, the size of this variable should not exceed 100 characters, assuming that who will ever write a number that consists of more than 100 characters. So if you write any number, definitely it should be less than 100 characters. Now, what will happen if you write a number that is more than 100 characters? So you put your hand like this, and you start writing number, and you put, instead of putting 100, you put 1000. So in this case, this amount of number will be sent to the variable to be saved that inside the memory. If the pro program is well written, it will not accept that. Like the calculator, if you try to put more than like 10 or 20 characters, he will not accept. So there is some limit. So uh, see, after a while, it will not start accept. But some of application has not been verified, the input has not been validated. So someone can send more information than the capacity of the variable. So they are sending, for instance, 2000 character inside a variable that can only have up to like 20 character. So what will happen in this case? As I told you, is a program, if the program is well written and the input is validated, the, uh, it will refuse to accept that. But if the program is not validated and uh, it's not when written, it will take those value and put them inside the uh, variable. Now, what happens is the variable can only have up to 10 or 20 characters. Where is the meaning of the character will be sent? It will be sent randomly in different places inside the memory. So this is the buffer overflow, that you send more information to a specific location that has a small capacity and you can overflow inside memory. So what is the advantage of doing that? If you do that, there is some location in memory that if you send something to them or information will be overflow on those specific location, it will execute whatever you ask them. So you tell them, execute this payload, it will execute the payload. Give me access on the machine, it will give you as a... So the, the objective here is to use this buffer overflow, which is a weakness inside the application, to get an advantage or to get access to a specific location in memory that will obey to whatever you're going to ask. So you can ask them to do anything on the computer, it will be done. So we're going to see that in action in the upcoming uh, couple of videos. On the previous video, we explained what is buffer overflow. Now we need to do a proof of concept regarding buffer overflow. So we need to, to start by asking, how do I know that such application has a buffer overflow? And then how to utilize those buffer overflow weakness to be able to uh, get access to the victim system. First, to identify which application has a buffer overflow, you can do that in two different ways. Actually, there is three different ways. First way is by searching. So from the section related to scanning and reconnaissance, and uh, by getting information about your victim, you should know some applications that run on the victim machine. It could be an operating system that it may have Windows XP or Windows 7 or 8 or Linux. You may be able to get some information about some specific application running, like, you know, you have a specific version of Acrobat Reader or any other software. And then you start searching about those applications. And we already explained that in a previous video that you can go to some of the website like Fo Security Focus or Security Tracker or, uh, or some underground website like ExploitDB. This was explained actually in the reconnaissance phase. And you start searching until you find that one of those applications has a buffer overflow. So this is one way for doing that by searching. You know, just get the information that you collected earlier and start searching about any weakness there. This is one way for doing that. A second way will be by reverse engineering. This is in case you have the code of this application. So if you have the 
code or the program of Microsoft Windows, which no one have except Microsoft, you'll be able to review that and read that and you understand what is the weakness. Or if there is some open source application, uh, application where you have the software, you can do that. Uh, do some reverse engineering and analyze the code and understand if the application accept more uh, characters than it should accept or not. The third way, and this is actually what we're going to do, it's to try to test the application yourself. So we try to keep sending character to the application until it crash. If it the application stop accepting character from our site for a specific amount of time or after uh, like uh, specific capacity, this is a good application. But if you keep accepting that until it crash, that means this application is affected with uh, buffer overflow. So we're going to do one demonstration, proof of concept, and then one like real life scenario. And then I'm going to give you a specific practice to do yourself and I'm going to expect your feedback on the discussion board and if you find any problem do that yourself let me know I'll help you I'll guide you step by step so we need a vulnerable application to be used for that so what we're going to use there is an application called Sika bomb so I want you to search on the internet. I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you the link, but I want you to search for Sika Boom. It's an application that open and uh, that is when you run it, it open on port 4321 and it's accepting a connection. So I want you to download this application. The the link will be shared with you in the uh, resources. So I already installed this application. So let me show you what I have. This is the application. I did install it on a virtual machine. Definitely you should not install that on your real machine. Everything should be done on a virtual machine. And when you open this application, it open, it run on port 4321. And it's waiting for a connection. Now, when you go to any other computer, I have a backtrack machine that I'm going to use uh, as my hacker machine. And if you try to connect to this machine. How can you connect to this machine? There is different way for doing that. I can do that using Netcat. So I can type Netcat and the IP of my victim machine, which is 192.168.95.137. Let me just check. So if I go, I just need to check if the IP is right or not. So if I go here, and I check here, 177, exactly. So uh, we can do that by Netcat. This is one way for connecting. So in Backtrack, I can type this IP, then space and the port number, 4321. Sorry, space, 4321. Okay, this is one way for connecting. Another way is using Telnet, so you can type Telnet space IP space the port number and it will connect to this open port number. Now it's connected and whatever you are writing here, it will be sent there. So if I write here A, B, C, D, E, F and I click on enter and I go there to my other machine, so you're going to find A, B, C, D, F. So those information that has been sent, are they saved on the hard drive? No, they are saved in memory. So this application is accepting variable from the user remotely and it puts them in memory. Definitely whoever decided this application, by the way, this is a testing application. Whoever deciding that, he's accepting user and puts them inside memory. So what happened is he should identify the capacity of the variable. So he's not just accepting any character that the user send, but definitely there is a maximum size. So if you keep sending information, it will keep accepting until it exceeds the capacity and then it will crash. Now, the problem is, how do I know how much should I send so it will be crashed and then I, I'll be aware that the application has a, a buffer overflow. 
I can keep sending, but this may take time because sometimes if you need to send 2,000, 4,000, 5,000, 10,000, so you can keep sending that, but you never know when it will crash. So I need something to automate this process, to keep sending until it crash. So the process for doing that, that keep sending information to an application to be stored in the variable until it exceeds the capacity and it overflow and the system crash. This is called fuzzing. Okay, so we're going to use a fuzzer application that are doing that. So I'm going to close that and I'm going to start the graphical interface. This is a backtrack machine. On the previous video, we explained what is buffer overflow. Now we need to do a proof of concept regarding buffer overflow. So we need to, to start by asking, how do I know that such application has a buffer overflow? And then how to utilize those buffer overflow weakness to be able to uh, get access to the victim system. First, to identify which application has a buffer overflow, you can do that in two different ways. Actually, there is three different ways. First way is by searching. So from the section related to scanning and reconnaissance, and uh, by getting information about your victim, you should know some applications that run on the victim machine. It could be an operating system that it may have Windows XP or Windows 7 or 8 or Linux. You may be able to get some information about some specific application running, like, you know, you have specific version of Acrobat Reader or any other software. And then you start searching about those applications. And we already explained that in a previous video that you can go to some of the website like Fo Security Focus or Security Tracker or, uh, or some underground website like ExploitDB. This was explained actually in the reconnaissance phase. And you start searching until you find that one of those applications has a buffer overflow. So this is one way for doing that, by searching. You know, just get the information that you collected earlier and start searching about any weakness there. This is one way for doing that. A second way will be by reverse engineering. This is in case you have the code of this application. So if you have the code or the program of Microsoft Windows, which no one have except Microsoft, you'll be able to review that and read that and you understand what is the weakness. Or if there is some open source application, uh, application where you have the software, you can do that. Uh, do some reverse engineering and analyze the code and understand if the application accept more uh, characters than it should accept or not. The third way, and this is actually what we're going to do, it's to try to test the application yourself. So we try to keep sending character to the application until it crash. If it the application stop accepting character from our site for a specific amount of time or after uh, like a uh, specific capacity, this is a good application. But if you keep accepting that until it crash, that means this application is affected with uh, buffer overflow. So we're going to do one demonstration, proof of concept, and then one like real life scenario. And then I'm going to give you a specific practice to do yourself and I'm going to expect your feedback on the discussion board and if you find any problem do that yourself let me know I'll help you I'll guide you step by step so we need a vulnerable application to be used for that so what we're going to use there is an application called Sika bomb so I want you to search on the internet. I'm going to I'm going to share with you the link, but I want you to search for Sika Boom. It's an application that open and uh, that is when you run it, it open on port 4321 and it's accepting a connection. So I want you to download this application. The, the link will be shared with you in the uh, resources. So I already installed this application. So let me show you what I have. This is the application. I did install it on a virtual machine. Definitely, you should not install that on your real machine. Everything should be done on a virtual machine. 
and when you open this application it open it run on port 4321 and it's waiting for a connection now when you go to any other computer I have a backtrack machine that I'm going to use uh, as my hacker machine and if you try to connect to this machine how can you connect to this machine there is a different way for doing that I can do that using netcat so I can type netcat and the IP of my victim machine which is 192.168.95.137 let me just check <clears throat> So if I go, I just need to check if the IP is right or not. So if I go here and I check here, um, 177, exactly. So uh, we can do that by Netcat. This is one way for connecting. So in Backtrack, I can type this IP, then space and the port number, 4321. Sorry space 4321 okay this is one way for connecting another way is using telnet so you can type telnet space ip space the uh, port number and it will connect to this open port number now it's connected and whatever you are writing here it will be sent there so if i write here a b c d e f and i click on enter and i go there to my other machine so you're going to find a b c d f so those informations that has been sent are they saved on the hard drive no they are saved in memory so this application is accepting variable from the user remotely and it puts them in memory definitely whoever decided this application by the way this is a testing application whoever deciding that he's accepting user and puts them inside memory so what happened is he should identify the capacity of the variable so he's not just accepting any character that the user send but definitely there is a maximum size so if you keep sending information it will keep accepting until it exceeds the capacity and then it will crash now the problem is how do i know how much should i send so it will be crashed and then i will be aware that the application has a, a buffer overflow I can keep sending, but this may take time because sometimes if you need to send 2,000, 4,000, 5,000, 10,000, so you can keep sending that, but you never know when it will crash. So I need something to automate this process, to keep sending until it crash. So the process for doing that, that keep sending information to an application to be stored in the variable until it exceeds the capacity and it overflow and the system crash this is called fuzzing okay so we're going to use a fuzzer application that are doing that so i'm going to close that and i'm going to start the graphical interface this is a backtrack machine but if you need the full image because actually it's a custom made image it's a very good one just uh, 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 publish on the discussion board and I'll make sure to send you the screen. So, uh, okay. So, this is my backtrack and I'm going to open a terminal. Here you go. And we are going to from the root a pen test and then fuzzer. And fuzzer has all the applications that is used for fuzzing and we are going to use a specific fuzzing application it's called spike so we're going to go to spike and let me see what we have here so in spike i think we should have a an application yes what you need to do here it's to create a file that end with spk like this one for instance or test this one so let me show you what this file has so if we like nano test sorry nano test dot spk and you're gonna see that this one is sending 
specific variable. I don't know what is that. Let me get something that is easier. Let me check. There is a one called ability. Ability dot spk. Now this one is defining a variable called a. So it's sending a capital A letter. So you can get this fi this file, and you just need to modify if you need to send number one or B or C. But you can keep it A because which letter you are using has nothing to do with the attack. You just choose a character that will be keep sent to the victim machine until it crash. So I'll keep this one the same way it is, but I'm just going to rename it. So it will be, sorry, control X, no. I'm going to copy this file, which is called ability.spike to, let me name it, for instance, uh, seeker.spk. Okay. So uh, we're going to have a file called seeker, seeker.spk that has, that defined a variable called A. Then we're going to use a comment. Let me show you how it looks like which is this comment, okay, uh, generic, and then send TCP, and then you put the IP, then the uh, uh, port number, and then the file, and then, I believe it was zero, zero. Now, what this comment will be doing, it will be, it will send from this file that you created, and we're going to change ability to Sika. Uh, so Sika has the letter A, so he will keep sending A to this server through this port until it crashed. So it will send the TCP traffic and it will keep doing that. So let's do this comment generic uh, send TCP and then the IP of the victim, which is 192.168. Dot ninety five dot one three seven, and then the port number which is four three two one, and then the file name which is sika dot spk, and then zero space zero. Now let me repeat what exactly this one will be doing. It will take the file sika uh, uh, that has letter A and keep sending this letter to the specific IP through the specific port and send from the other one. There is an application that keep accepting and putting inside memory and it will keep sending this A letter until it overflows. So what happens is, if after a while the system crash, that means it's infected with buffer overflow, he will keep accepting until it crash. But if it stop after a while and it's not accepting, that means this application is not affected with buffer overflow. So let's, oh, I'm sorry, we need to, we didn't run the application on the victim machine, so we need to go here, run Sikabom, and go back, and let's run that. Okay, so he keeps sending, and let's see if the application crashed or not. So as you can see, exactly, here you go. So he kept sending until the application crashed. This is telling you what exactly? Telling you that this application, who used to accept input from a user remotely, he was taking this input to a variable inside memory, but the variable was not well defined. So he, keep, he kept receiving until he crashed, he overflowed. So now I know that this application is affected with buffer overflow. What are we going to do next? Next, instead of sending A, I can analyze the traffic, where exactly it has been sent, and which part of the memory has received that. And according to that, I can, instead of sending A, I can instead uh, send a payload that will give me full access on the machine. So on the next video, we're going to see how to analyze that, to be able to utilize that to compromise the machine. Hello, 
I received many requests for creating some additional video, especially to the buffer overflow subject. And uh, this is very good because buffer overflow, it's one of the most technical subject in this course. So I'm going to create two different video related to two different vulnerable application. And we're going to do the buffer overflow from start together until we create our own exploit and explain how to use them. So I hope it will be very detailed video. It may be a little bit long because this is better than dividing this video to different subject to maintain the continuity of the subject. So let's uh, start. So I'm going to start first by defining the buffer overflow and then we're going to start doing the attack. Now I explain on the uh, buffer overflow section. What is a buffer overflow? It's to over uh, float uh, the capacity of a variable inside memory. And uh, I give an example like this application calculator where you can write down number here and where exactly those number will be saved. They'll, they will be saved inside memory. So the programmer who created this application while he was creating it he declares some variable inside the memory and those variables should have a capacity so he said okay let's create one variable and this variable will hold number from the user and it should be maximum 10 character or 100 or 10,000 whatever but it should have a capacity now what if I try to write down more than the capacity of the variable inside memory. We agree that whatever we are writing here will be saved inside memory. Now what if I keep pressing number more than the capacity? We're going to have two options. If the program is well designed, he will not accept more of its capacity. So the capacity is 100, you are trying to send 110, he will not accept that. If the program is not well designed and you try to send more than the variable capacity, it will accept and start throwing them randomly inside memory. So you have a capa variable capacity of 100 and you send 1000, it will accept the 1000, but since its capacity is only 100, it will keep the 100 and whatever remaining, it will spread them inside the memory in different locations. Now for calculator, as you can see, he's not accepting more than the capacity. This is the buffer overflow. And actually this is one type of buffer overflow. Buffer overflow, it's a very big subject, but we just focus on one of the topics. So this is the concept. And now let's see the implementation of that. So I have two different machines. I have the Windows machine that has a program called Sika uh, POM. And the uh, Sikapom is an uh, application that uh, open port on the local machine 4321 and accept information from any remote machine. So you run the application, this is how it looks like. And uh, it, what happens is that when you run the application, it's opening the port 4321 and it's accepting, accepting connection. So let me go to my backtrack machine just to verify the concept or to see how to use this CKPOM application. So I'm going to open a terminal here and I'm going to try to uh, Telnet, which is remote connection tool, Telnet, and I'm going to put the IP of the Windows machine, 192.168.95.137 with port 4321 and enter. And as you can see, you connect to the CKPOM server and whatever you are writing here, for instance, and you click on enter, it will be sent to the other, uh, other machine. So it's a simple application that accept input from the user and definitely those are saved inside memory. And it just allow to, uh, to, for remote computer to send information and take those information and save them and, and put them inside memory. Now the question is, what if I keep sending a okay are he going to accept that or not now as i told you in the previous example in calculator if you keep sending a or b or whatever character it will reach a stage 
where the program will refuse or accept, depend about how good its design is. So if the program is well designed, he will refuse after specific amount of letter, depend on the capacity of the variable. But if he's not well designed, he will keep accepting and after a while it crash, it will crash. And crashing mean that he keep receiving and sending them in the random place inside memory. And according to that, it will crash. So I know that this application is vulnerable, except how can I test that? I mean, you know, should I keep sending because it, it may be like 100 character or it may be 10,000 character. I cannot keep sending A or B or any character in, until it crash. So how can we test that? We can do that in different way. A hard way will be to get the source code of the application and review the source code and do reverse engineering to try to figure out the flow. But actually this requ required some programming skills and it's not easy to do that. The second way will be using website. So if I keep searching on website about this product, I'll be able to figure out that if it has a buffer overflow or not. The third way, and this will be the way that we are going to use, it's using something called the fuzzer. And fuzzer, F U double Z, it's an application that keeps sending character to the affected program or the tested program until it crash. So it will figure out that it has a buffer overflow or it refuse accepting uh, uh, character. So it's, it's a well-designed application. So let me show you how the fuzzer is working. So we saw the program. Let's see how the fuzzer working. Let me restart the program. And uh, here you go. And let me show you how to run a fuzzer. Uh, there is a lot of them, and as I keep saying in this course, do not stuck with a specific application. I mean, if you understand the concept, you'll be able to find and search for other tools. But let me show you the built-in tool inside Linux. So we go inside the folder under root. There is a folder called pen test. And under pen test, there is fuzzer. And there is a lot of fuzzer applications there, but I prefer one specific fuzzer called spike. It's a nice program and easy to use. Now, before using the, because it's command line program, before using the command to send uh, those continuously buffer until the program crash, there is one specific file inside this folder that you need to create or change. I mean, I created one. You can take my file and change inside, or you can create your own, just one line. So, and you can name it whatever you want. It has to be uh, just with an extension SPK. So name it whatever name you want, but just make sure that you save it with an extension X, uh, SPK. So my file is called ability. So this is needed to run the fuzzer, uh, th this specific kind of fuzzer, ability.spk. And as I told you, name is optional, but extension is mandatory. So it has only one line. This line represents what will be sent to the vector machine. So in my case, I'm telling him, I want you to define a variable A. You can make A or B or C, but this is what will be sent continuously to the CKPOM application until it crash or it, uh, it uh, stop receiving them. So you have to write the same comment, except you need to uh, like uh, change that to A or B or C, depending. It doesn't make any difference. Just, you know, any character that will be sent continuously. Now let's see how to use the comment, uh, how to use the fuzzer application. So uh, we're going to write down the comment. It should be written this way. Generic send TCP. So I'm telling him I need to send the TCP traffic and then I'm going to put the IP and port because you should not just put an IP. You have to put through which port this information will be sent. 68.95.137 and the port 4321 and then you you the comment so far you are telling him i need to send something to this ip through this port and then you need to write down the
and then you need to write down the ability the name of the file that has the characters that will be sent and finally we write zero zero and we start sending oh sorry I wrote incorrect IP it's 192.168 so let's correct that 168 excellent so as you can see he kept sending a letter to the machine until it stopped by stopping here mean one of two the machine refused to accept or it has crashed so let's go to the windows machine if you give it like few seconds you're gonna notice that the machine will crash or uh, the application has been crashed this is actually excellent that means that the application keep receiving character and store them in the variable and the variable capacity was lower so he starts sending them randomly inside location memory until it crash so this crash is an indication that this application has a buffer overflow now we need to start analyzing that so let me just close that and we need to see where exactly those information has been saved so the point is okay it's it's affected with buffer overflow and as i told you buffer overflow mean he received all the information and spread them inside memory and it reached a stage where it crashed because memory cannot take anymore now the question is what is the important part here inside the memory there is some specific location that is considered extremely important and those locations are the place where they are controlling what application should be running so the point here if those a that has been sent randomly has reached those places those critical places that mean we can customize instead of sending a i can send some code and i can enforce the memory to execute those code so the next step will be to see those a where exactly they have been saved inside memory and where is the critical location and did the critical location get overwritten with those a or not so let's see how to do this so to be able to see that i want to introduce to you a very important program for people who's working in penetration testing it's a program that map memory it's very very important to understand how memory is working not just to understand how to use tool so to be able to do that we have a program called debugger memory debugger and there is a lot of them only debugger immunity debugger. i personally use this program it's very very easy and i'm going to try to explain to you what you need to understand about it because it's kind of complicated but you only going to need to check two different locations now how to use this program i'm going to first open my application one more time <coughs> Seek a home application and then we're gonna open the immunity debugger okay and then immunity debugger will not just open the memory and that's it immunity debugger has to be associated with a specific program because immunity debugger what it, what it's doing it trace the input out and output from the memory for one specific application so what you need to do you need to tell him what application you are tracing what application you want to see his behavior inside memory so to be able to do that you go to file and you click on attach and you check you're going to find all the program running in memory including ckpom so let's check what is ckpom application here is the application ckpom okay and you click on attach once it opens the application it will show the screen don't get disturbed about all those hex and assembly and so on just look on this side of the screen and please focus with me by the way when we are while you are watching this video please keep stopping on each step and verify that yourself okay do not wait until the end of the video just uh, step by step start like tracing what i'm doing so here we have two extremely important parts we have the EIP okay this is very very important 
place inside memory. And EIP is the place in memory that controls the flow or that decide what program to be executed. Okay, so EIP, it's a place in memory that decide which program need to be executed. And a very important characteristic about EIP is that it can only accept four characters. Okay. Second important part is the ESP, this one. And ESP, it's like a pointer, or let's say it's like a container that holds the, the, the program that will be executed. So we have a part that control what to be executed and what not to be executed, and we have a part that holds the program. It's like a storage or a pointer. Okay. This is what I am concerned inside the Immunity Breaker. Whatever it's showing the other, I don't, I don't care. And as I told you at the beginning, what we are going to do in this video, we are going to create our own exploit. Okay. So it's very, very important to understand those two variables inside this memory. Okay. Just bear with me. You know? After a while, you'll understand how things is related together. So my point is, I have to place in memory, and then what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to rerun the fuzzer one more time, and I'm going to send those A one more time to this specific machine. My objective is, if those A that I send to this application that has buffer overflow, and I keep accepting until it crash, if I open the debugger and I found that the EIP and ESP has been overwritten with A, that means that I'm able to reach the critical place, in, uh, place inside memory. And this will allow me to create whatever code to be executed right away and compromise the system right away. So my objective is those A that I keep sending randomly to the system, are they going to override the EIP and ESP or not? Okay, so let's see. Now, I did associate my program with uh, uh, CKPOM application, except when, when you do that for the first time, you're going to notice down here it's paused. It will froze the program. So you need to release the program by clicking on this play. And now the program is running. And the immunity debugger is tracing the program. So let's go to our Windows machine and let's repeat the, I'm sorry, the backtrack machine and let's repeat the uh, fuzzer one more time. He sent all the A. Definitely the program crashed. I don't care. I just need to check here what happened. Okay. Now let's check what do we have inside EIP. What do we have? We have 41, 41, 41, 41. 41, those are A in hexadecimal. So that means from the f amount of A that I sent, the a reach and override the AIP. This is a very, very good sign. Okay. And do not forget that AIP can only hold four character. Very, very important piece of information. Now let's check the ESP. What do we have inside ESP? Can you see ESP have all the A as well? So also my A has overwrite, overwritten the ESP. And if you right click here and you click on follow dump, you can notice down here on your left hand side, all are A. So, to simplify the, the, the concept till now, that we have a program with buffer overflow, and I was able to discover that using a fuzzer that keeps sending random information until the program crashed, which is a sign of buffer overflow. And I open immunity debugger to see where exactly those A has been saved, the, the overflowed uh, A, and I notice that the overflowed A has reach the critical place inside memory, which is the EIP and ESP. Okay. So by knowing that I can change those A to something readable to the computer, allow me to compromise the system. So I can tell him instead of sending a, send me a code and I'm going to show you how to let the computer execute it using the EIP and ESP. Okay. Now let's let's analyze that and let's start creating our own exploit, okay? Because now it's a good sign, and uh, it's uh, showing that we can compromise the system through this program. 
network is assuming that uh, I found that network is very yeah. secure, but because my victim or my target has a vulnerable application with buffer overflow, I'm going to use this attack to attack and compromise the system through the application layer. Okay, let's see how to do this. So let me close and let's see what will be the next step. Now, the next step that we're going to need to identify, we need to know how many character we sent. I need to open a notepad here and I'm going to write. Number one, how many character or how many A? How many A letter lead to over buffer overflow? So I noticed that it sent a lot of A, but it's very, very important to get the number. How many character when I send them to this application, it crashed the application? Okay. I can count them, but this will be hard. I mean, you know, I tried them. Uh, 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 let me open the application one more time. And let's go to our backtrack machine. And uh, it sent and the application crash. So I can go and count them, but it, it, it's not an easy process. You know, all those A and so on. So it cannot be done this way. We have another way for doing that which is using Wireshark, okay? So Wireshark, it's a sniffing program. It's built in inside Linux. I'm going to open it. Uh, Wireshark. Sniffing program, it's built in inside Linux. I'm going to open it. Uh, Wireshark. Okay, and uh, let me just start the application. Wireshark will capture everything and will allow me to count them. So a very important piece of information, it's to know how much character has led to cracking the system. So let me open Seekapom one more time. And before running the fuzzer, I'm going to just run Wireshark, ask him to capture traffic. So, okay, Wireshark, here you go, and capture interface, and on the ETH0, the wi wired interface, I'm going to ask him to start capturing, and he start capturing, okay, good, I'm going to run the fuzzer one more time, it will send those A, it will crash the system, so system will be crashed, definitely, excellent, going back to backtrack now i can stop the wireshark so what i'm doing right now i'm trying to figure out how many a led to uh crashing system now you're going to see that he monitor all the and capture all the traffic but uh, what is my computer ip if config the backtrack ip should be oh i'm sorry it's case sensitive if config It's 192.168.95.137 and the Windows machine, it's 137. So I need to check the traffic from 130 to 137. It should be at the beginning. One, here you go, not yet, not yet. From one nine, uh, from nine five to one three, I can filter them instead of keep searching for all kind of traffic. So you can apply a filter, select it. So it will show you all the traffic from this machine between those two machines. Now let's take any one of those and click on follow them. It will show you how the amount of A's that has been sent. Now still I cannot count them like that, but I'm going to do something nice in Linux. I'm going to copy them in a file and count the letter of the file. But notice you cannot copy everything because you cannot say send A to the machine and then the victim machine replied back with welcome to ability and then, uh, I'm sorry, welcome to uh, server and then he sent A again. So you need to take only A. So I'm going to copy them. Copy. And let's go to, uh, let me just maximize, maximize this Windows. 
and uh, let me open a terminal and let me create a file nano i'm gonna name that flow you can name it whatever you want i'm just need to save the information inside and count them this is the easiest way so those are the first a so let's let's take the remaining a till the end and here you go copy and let's put them inside this file as well paste and <laughs> as you notice that we we have one extra character without a so whatever number we're gonna have we need to execute or uh, decrease one of them because uh, you know you cannot delete the space so let's save them control x yes now how can I count the content of the file? There is a command in Linux called wc, word count, and then you, you type the file name, which is flow. Flow. So he's going to tell you, okay, flow file has 5001 character. I told you that there is one empty space, so it should be 5000. This is extremely important to our attack, that I know that if I send 5000 character, A or B or C, 2, 3, 2, the vulnerable application it will crash this is where all your attack will be built okay <clears throat> so the first part was to under to figure out how many character will lead to crashing the system second point now do you remember what i told you about let me close clean the screen what i explained about the memory what is what is the important part inside memory EIP and ESP. Let's take the EIP because this is the major part. Okay, so EIP. Uh, okay, let me open another terminal. EIP. Do you remember? I told you EIP is the most important part inside memory. EIP. If you remember, I told you it only holds four characters. But if I'm able to know which four characters, this will be very important because as i told you eip will allow me to execute whatever i want remotely the problem now is i need to know i sent 5000 a and they have been overwritten in different places in memory i need to know which four character has been overwriting a is it the first four second third fourth how can i do that it's very important to know which four character from those 5000 has been or has overwrite eip we can do that in two different way we have a mathematical way it will take some attempt but it it will be sending instead of sending 5000 a we can send 1000 a 1000 b 1000 c 1000 e and if it show on the first thousand that means it's inside the first thousand then I'm going to divide the first thousand to 500A and 500B and then 250B and C and so on and this will take eight attempt but it will take time there is another way for doing that which is a, actually a tool inside backtrack called pattern create but before doing using this tool to identify which 4A has overwrite EIP let me show you a small script that actually I didn't download them, but I, I, I didn't uh, write them. I download them from the internet and I shared them during this course. It's a very small Python script that allow you, and instead of keep using those uh, further application, you can use a small script to test that. So I downloaded the script and you can customize the script for any application with buffer overflow. Uh, let me see what was the name ls i think it was first let me check no, no. first dot py yeah this is the script but uh, let me take another copy control x because i usually won't like to leave the script what is it? control x no and so i'm going to make another copy from this file from first dot py and i'm going to name that for instance uh, uh, seek dot py okay just for and then we're going to open this file now 
you don't have to know anything about Python. Okay, it's very easy to read, and as I told you, you're gonna need to customize them. Nano C K dot P Y. Oh, sorry. Control X C K dot P. First. I think I made something wrong. Okay. Okay, let's copy first the py to s.py. And then nano s.py. As I told you, you don't need to know anything about Python. Very easy to use. You just here. Uh, this is the comments that create a connection, so you don't need to do anything about that. Here you are writing a variable called buffer. You can name it anything, buffer, ABC, XYZ, anything. And inside this buffer you are putting 2041. 41, uh, if you remember, I told you those are A in hexa. If you need to put B, you put 42, C, 43. So, and then you connect to this IP, to this port. Okay, so we need to change that and then you send the buffer. So you create something and you connect and you send the, this thing. Now here we're going to do some modification. I told you how many characters led to crashing system was 5,000. 5,000. Okay. And this is the IP. The IP is correct, but the port is different. 4321. Okay, so we're going to remove this 21. Because this will be our basic script that we're going to use to com to create an exploit that can be used to any computer has this application. Okay, let's test it. S dot py. And let's go to Windows. Rerun the application. And run. Man. So in instead of using the fuzzer, I can use this application. But I needed the fuzzer to, un to figure out how many characters led to that because fuzzer is sending continuously while the script is sending a specific amount that you decide. So, okay, something is wrong. Let's see. Nano. Okay, the problem with those applications is that sometimes if you forget a character or something, oh yeah, like here, this has, it will not give this uh, apostrophe. So control X is very small script and when you read it, it's readable. So he sends a buffer. Let's go to the system, uh, the Windows machine, and it crash. So we're going to use that now to compromise or to create our ex exploit to compromise our system. We're just going to need to analyze those uh, uh, settings. It crash. So we're going to use that now to compromise or to create our ex exploit, to compromise our system. We're just going to need to analyze those uh, setting. I'm sorry if I'm going step by step and very, I'm trying to be very simplified. Hope I'm not letting you feeling boring. Now, the first step was to get the number of characters that led to crashing system. Second step is to know which one from those 5,000 has overwrite EIP and which one has overwrite ESP, which are our major part inside the attack. As I told you, you can do that in two different ways. I'll take the backtrack way. It may involve some steps, but I want you to get familiar with that. So we are going to keep this terminal or uh, even from this same terminal. Let's go to this specific location. We're going to go CD to the root, then pen test, then uh, exploit, then framework three, then tools. Okay. Inside this folder, there is two clear. There is two applications that we're going to use. 
one of them called pattern offset and pa pattern create and pattern offset here you go okay those are the tools that we're going to use let's take the first one pattern create so we're going to put here the command pattern create 5000 One, two, three. And what this program will do, it will create a 5,000 character. So here, okay. So don't worry about what it looked like. Let me open another browser, another terminal, and let, let me go to our exploits at, you know, the s.py. So nano s.py. And I'm going to remove this, but I'm not remove it because I'm, I'm going to need it. I'm just going to put the sign before it. And this sign mean ignore this buffer. I'm going to create another buffer. Okay. So I'm telling him whatever you put hash before any comment in Python mean ignore this line right now. So it will not be executed. So I'm going to write another buffer equal and put apostrophe. And then we're going to take those 5,000 character and copy them inside the buffer. So here you go. So I'll take them to the last one and then copy. And we are going to save them here, paste and close with apostrophe. So I created another buffer, not 5000E, but this buffer. Okay. And control X, Y, and enter. Excellent. Now we're going to run the script one more time, except I'm going to go to my Windows machine and we're going to run Sikapom and we're going to run the immunity debugger one more time. Where is it? Immunity, immunity, immunity. Here you go. Okay. We're going to run. Remember this is the program to trace the flow. And then we are going to file and we are going to attach and point to our application Sikapom. here you go and don't forget to release the program attach oh I'm sorry I didn't do it yeah it's attach and you have to as you can see it's paused so you have to release the program so now it's running and we are going to send the buffer one more time here you go S dot py it will send it will crash the system okay and now I'm gonna go to the system and I'm gonna get what is inside EIP let me try to maximize the screen so you can see what exactly we are doing sorry so Let's see what do we have inside the IP. So what has been overwritten inside the IP? 386941. Let me write it down. So now EIP has this value. Here we go. So EIP has the value of 3869 four one three seven one three seven okay what about esp esp has the value of we, we just need the first four character capital a small i then nine then capital a excellent okay now let me get back here happen I do control Z sorry I overwrite so EIP EIP I told you it's the most um, critical part ESP has capital E then I then nine that capital E okay now going back to the backtrack machine and going back to the same folder from where I create uh, those 
uh, random character I can use another command called pattern offset instead of pattern create so I'm going to type pattern offset and then we're going to put the EIP first so here which was 38693 38693 I'm just telling them could you tell me from those 5000 character which one has those because as I told you what we are doing right now we need to figure out where exactly which four character has been overwritten EIP then 4137 then 4137 click on enter and I think we got something wrong let's see if we wrote it 3 8 Three eight six nine four one three seven four one three seven. No, it's not right. Let's check the Windows machine. Just one second. Okay, it's uh, EIP three eight six nine four one three seven. 38694137 Let's get back to the backtrack and uh, let's see Okay I think my mistake I'm sorry So I asked him where exactly I found those from those 5,000. He said after 263. So this is the important part here. What this meaning what exactly? 263. That means from those 5,000 characters that I sent after 263. So the first 263 will be saved inside memory in any place. I don't care. The after character the, the four character after that those are the characters that will be sent to the EIP so whatever you are sending after 263 character it will be sent to the EIP which control the execution of memory okay ESP let's see the ESP so I can repeat the same command except I'm gonna put what I found inside ESP so instead of that we're gonna put capital A and then I 9a and we're going to see that ESP start writing after 267 so let's write it down here ESP after 267 excellent so now we're going to reflect that in our scenario let's get back to our sorry let's get back to our uh, uh, script s.py and let's remove the new buffer okay you don't need to keep uh, you don't need to delete it just put the sign so it will not be executed and let's get back to our buffer here let's remove this hash and let's configure this buffer sorry so it will like uh, work or it will be adjusted the same way we are so for instance we agree that first we have 263 those will be sent anywhere okay it doesn't matter then we're gonna ask him to send it has to be written the same way x42 do, don't forget x42 main main b later on we're gonna replace those a and b and c and put a payload x42 and then x42 and then x42 i can write it this way or i can write x42 multiply 4 1 2 3 and then one more x42 so and then close this scan and what is remaining so total should be 5000 as we agree so let's see how much will be remaining so we have 5000 
minus 263 minus 4 equal so what whatever remaining will be 4 4,733 uh, uh, 4, put them C for instance so that's mean I want to send 5,000 x 43 multiply multiply 4733 733 so the point here that I'm sending those 5,000 again the same 5,000 except I'm just checking if I'm able to reach the EIP right away so if this script is working fine I should find on the AIP only 42, 42, 42. So by doing that, if it's success, that means that I'm able to reach the EIP. And this will be the final phase in the analysis. The next step would be creating the attack. So let's test it first to make sure that it reaches the EIP the same way at all. So by doing that, if it works successfully, I should find the EIP hold 42, 42, 42, and the ESP hold all C. Okay. Now, do not forget that the total amount should be 5,000. If you put more, it will not be working because you just send the amount that will crash the system. So before running that, let me go back to my Windows machine. And uh, let me restart that. Let me close the immunity debugger. And let me open one more time Seekabon and open one more time the uh, immunity debugger and connect that we are just trying to configure our code so it will send to the critical part and if you success till the end you'll be able to create your own exploit that you can launch on any application that have ccapom and it will exploit it so you are doing something that will not just attack this windows machine any machine that holds this application will be uh, uh, accessible or could be compromised using this technique. So uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. What is our application? See, Capom, I think this is the one. Attach. And do not forget to release because it's paused. And now run. let's run our script. It's sent. It will crash. I don't care. I am just want to see if it has... Oh, okay excellent can you see eip has been overwritten 42 42 42 and esp has as you can see all c and if you go here follow dump you're going to notice that all the c has been sent to the esp this is actually excellent and this is the exhausting part whatever remaining it's very easy to configure okay now i think i'm going to stop the video here and i'm going to start a new video because it took around one hour and I'm not sure it will, I'll be able to uh, upload that so let me stop here and resume on the next video but before stopping let me remind you that I think I, I was able to uh, check if an application was uh, uh, affected with buffer overflow I was able to get how much character when we sent to this application it will crash and then I start analyzing so now I know that after the 263 character sent to this application the fourth character after that will overwrite uh, EIP and then after 267 it's ESP after that we're going to remove those A and B and C and we're going to put the payload that will give me access to the machine so let's see you next video thank you So now the easy part, what to do? I know that the application has a buffer overflow and I know that it crashed after 5000. I know that after 263, whatever I'm gonna send, it will overwrite EIP. And after 267, it will overwrite ESP. Excellent. So now the easy part. I need to remove those A and B and C and put a payload and a payload that will give me full access to the machine. How can I do that? Actually, it's quite easy let's do it step by step so we're gonna go to our uh, uh, Linux machine where is it the backtrack machine 
and we are going to open the uh, meat exploit go to penetration I'm looking for a payload to remove the C and put a payload so we're gonna go to penetration and we are going to go to uh, meet exploit framework version 2 the web based one and actually this website will help me to create a payload you can find that in many websites but this is the easier way when you open this web based uh, it will ask you to open any browser and type this IP 127.0.0.1 colon 5555 and this is the local host IP with the specific port so we're gonna open that and on one of the previous video we, we tried this uh, Metasploit framework version 2 but uh, it was just to do some small attacks here we're gonna use it for one different reason so we're gonna put this IP with this port and it will open that what I'm looking for right now is not the exploit we are looking for a payload I need to create the payload and put them inside my script so you can see that there is a lot of payload but we're gonna choose uh, Windows we, I can choose the Windows bind shell that will connect to the victim machine but if it has a firewall if he has a firewall it will be blocked so the most effective one will be the Windows Windows reverse uh, shell so this will allow the victim to connect to me so it will, can bypass the firewall so he gonna said okay I'm gonna create a shell that connect back to your machine this is IP of your machine on port 4321 you can keep this port or put any other port because this is the local port that will accept the connect uh, connection from the machine in my case I'm gonna put a different port so I will not be confused between uh, so I'm gonna put 4444 four, four. you can put anything you want and otherwise you can and then nothing need to be changed and you can create generate the payload and he will generate the payload that will be used instead of those C now a very important thing to check before copying the, the the size what is the size of the payload because I told you before all the payload should be 5000 so the size here is 312 let's write this down what is my notepad so here we're gonna write the payload that I'm gonna use is 312 excellent so I'm gonna take this payload here you go till the end of it and I'm gonna copy that inside my script so going back to our script and instead of you know writing I can do something easier I can go here and I'm gonna name this one shell or payload shell equal and you can open comma and paste that paste and close this comma so it will be easy to navigate without keep pasting everything so inside my buffer here I will put the payload uh, or the shell I named it shell so I'm gonna put it here after the EIP okay so we're gonna put shell so it means that send 263 shell plus that uh, 263a then 4b then the shell code then whatever remaining C but here this is 312 don't forget that all of them should be 5000 so I need to move those 312 for, from the remaining part so this should be 4733 minus 312 equal 4421 excellent so I'm going to remove that 4421 okay and so far so good now two point two point remaining here okay the first point is okay when I run this exploit it will send the payload inside the ESP right and total will be 5000 except it will not be executed who controls the execution the EIP what what is inside the EIP right now nothing B B B B so I need to put something inside the EIP that will enforce him to execute what is inside the ESP. So this is the first point. I need to 
replace those four meanless four two two four two four two four two which is B and put something that will execute what is inside the SP and what is inside the SP my payload how can I do that now there is some code inside Windows that enforce to execute the ESP those code are named jump ESP I need to search inside memory for a specific called uh, code called jump ESP and I take this code and I put them inside the EIP so when the uh, uh, when this code is sent to the memory the jump ESP once it overwrite the EIP it will execute what is in the ESP how can I get this jump ESP let's go to our Windows machine and let's here open this E letter from the debugger E will show all the process that run inside the memory I'm gonna check to one of those two user 32 or kernel this usually includes those jump ESP so I'm gonna open this user 32 and I'm gonna right click on the screen and ask him to search for a command and inside the command we're gonna type jump ESP I'm looking for a command that enforce the execution in whatever is inside the ESP and I click on find so he already find one let me show it to you Control. okay here we go jump ESP and what is the code it's 7 e 429353 so this code if I overwrite if I put that instead of the 42 42 42 when I launch this exploit when I launch this program it will execute whatever is inside ESP and what do we have inside the ESP the payload that will do a connection to our machine let's try this okay sorry 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 uh, jump ESP let's search it for one more time search for command uh, a command here you go and jump PSP and here you go 7e42 so uh, let's take the jump PSP so let me write it down here what is the good code for jump PSP jump uh, ESP it's equal four uh, seven seven E it's case sensitive don't forget forty two uh, ninety three fifty three excellent and let's put that in our payload let's go to our machine so we're gonna go to our buffer here where is it and i'm gonna replace let me write down here the jump psp let's put okay i don't have to confuse you jump psp i'm gonna put them here instead of for, uh, 42 42 42 but because we are using an intel machine the jump psp should be written in something called ending architecture I don't want to disturb you with technical subject but the point is you just need to read them from like end to start so we go here to ESP let me just put those windows together so so with here 7e so as you notice I start from the end 7e instead of this uh, f the last 42 and then 42 okay let's see if it's the same way it is and then 93 so this is 93 and then 53 so this is 53 so as you can see i wrote the eip now this is theoretically excellent if it's everything was configured well and you launch that it will connect to our machine on port 4444 so it will do a reverse connection just one point remaining sometimes this will maybe executed or not so for as a best practice we used to do something we used to add before the shell code we used to add 16 something called the null byte x90 so we add those 16 
uh, it's like an empty space where the shell code can be executed. So it's the best practice. So we can add here before shell code x90 uh, multiply 16 and then what do we have to change plus shell we need to remove the 16 from the last number so the total will maintain will be still 5000 so from here 4421 okay uh, 4421 uh, let's remove from here 16 should be 4405 okay so 44 four, four, oh, sorry 4405 uh, 440 I don't know what's wrong yeah here we go 4405 and remove whatever remaining okay so this is actually should be working this way but before run the script when you run the script if it runs successfully what will happen it will connect to our machine right now on port 44 do we have any open port listening and waiting for this connection we don't so we need to before running this exploit we need to go to any terminal and ask him to and VLP Netcat will open a port and wait for the connection on port 24444. Okay, so let's pray that it's gonna work. And let's see, I'm gonna go to my machine, I'm gonna close that. I don't need the debugger anymore, just run the application and go to my backtrack and run my script. Uh, S dot py and hopefully no something is wrong uh, you know it could be space it could be something let's see so it shows that inside the buffer we have small problem uh, x uh, everything here is fine plus could be that we need to add like space here okay and shell plus okay let's try one more time control x y let's run it no still it's showing that x41 multiply you know if you forget just an apostrophe it will not be working plus x53 plus x90 multiply 16 shell plus x43 multiply 4405 invalid syntax uh, actually I think that I may deleted something while I was doing that so just let's see multiply plus x42 and then buffer connect as close yeah I think I, I added like some spaces okay so for this is the hash line uh, it's not needed but it's, it will take long time to delete it so I just put this hash control X yes enter okay so it launched let's see what happened on the other terminal we get a shell on our machine now this is actually huge because do you know what we already did we sh we created an exploit that because we study the program where ex exactly it saves its information how it uh, overrides the critical places and everything now you have an exploit by the name of s.py that any uh, any computer that has 
Sika POM application running on it. You can run it on this application. You just need to change the IP and it will have a reverse connection on your machine. So you created your own exploit. I know it's a lot of steps, but if you keep repeating them and you keep like, you know, analyzing the situation, you will understand them very well. On the next video, I'm going to do a similar scenario to another program just to like make sure that you got the concept very well. And if it's still not clear enough, I don't mind do a remote session with any one of you guys just to help him understand and like a one on one training session to uh, help on that. Thank you so much and see you next video. Now we are going to take another example for buffer overflow. It will be just a revision, but on this time we are going to use a real application, not like the previous one that was just an experimental application. Seekapum is just an application for testing, while the one that we can use right now is just a real application. So the application name is Ability Server and it was affected with buffer overflow. So we're going to repeat the previous attack and we're going to compromise this computer from the buffer overflow attack uh, that, is uh, that is related to the ability server application. So from the application, I'm going to get full access to the machine. Now, I want to show you the script that I'm going to use. It's actually the same script, except I just made some few modifications. And uh, to be honest, I'm not the one who made the modification. I just downloaded it from the internet. But this and the previous script, you can use that for any application that has buffer overflow. Because it's quite understand, understand uh, you can quite easily understand the content of it. And you can utilize it depend on the... So as you can see, the script name is Ability. Uh, you notice that it's exactly the same as like the previous one, except on this time. I added two different lines. Now, Ability Server, it's an application that allows you to run uh, your computer as an HTTP, where you can host page and it will work as a web server, or as an email server, so you can send and receive the email from here, or as an FTP server. So FTP, when you activate the service on Ability Server, you need to set up a username and password. This is we uh, rare actually. Not all of the application you're gonna find that, but you know it's it's not about how the application is work is how you utilize the buffer overflow to get compromising or, or to compromise the system. So since if I try to connect manually from the Linux machine to the Windows machine, I'll be requested for use username and password. So in my script, I added those two lines where once it connect, as you can see, S connect and the IP and the port. And you notice that the port is 21 because by default the FTP server is open on 21. While if you choose the uh, HTTP, you should connect on port 80. And uh, uh, mail 3, you should connect, I believe, on port uh, 110. Uh, and those two servers will not request a username and password, so you can use the previous script. But this one, when you connect to it, it will request username and password. I already added username and password FTP and FTP. So I created an account. So here I connect and once I requested for username, I put FTP and password, I put FTP. Again, this does not mean that, you know, you need to be aware of the credential of the application. It's just that I was looking for an application that has a buffer overflow and I find this one and I wanted to prove the concept. Okay. And on the this script also, I went through the first part of the attack where if you remember i need to identify how many character was actually allowing to crash the system and uh, on the previous one was 5000 5000 character were led to crashing system while here is 2000 second i was able to identify after how many character from those 2000 it will override the eip if you remember uh, on the previous uh, one it was 263 while here is 965 and then 4 EIP and then 16 anything and then whatever 
we're gonna write here it will override the ESP so and instead of going through the same step of uh, uh, fuzzing and sending different character and get them and using Wireshark and so on I did that but I will strongly recommend that you do that step by step again just to uh, be familiar with the concept so this is the basic script I just need to make sure that this is right this this part will override the main area EIP and ESP and if so I'm gonna remove the ESP and put my payload and I'm gonna remove the EIP and put the jump ESP and I'm gonna compromise the system according to that before starting working on the script let's validate my script so how can I validate my script let me first save that and uh, uh, I'm gonna open uh, a debugger if you remember the ability debugger and I'm just need I just need to make sure that my script is valid and the EIP will be overwritten with this uh, 42 so where is my abilities my uh, immunity debugger here you go so we're gonna run the immunity debugger and we are going to don't forget we need to attach the immunity debugger to my ability server here you go attach and then we need to release because as you remember it usually you're going to pause the application so you click on release and then let's try to run the script ability dot py and it will crash but it doesn't matter I just need to see how things went and if you can see the EIP has been overwritten with 42 and that's mean my script is okay I just need to configure my the remaining part of the script so everything is fine now we just need to customize the payload to be uh, effective and compromise the system so I'm gonna open that and just I'm just repeating the step just you know memorize what we spoke about earlier so here we're gonna go to the script nano ability server and first I need to put here on the ESP we need to put uh, a payload from where can I get the payload so if you remember we need to go to backtrack and then to uh, penetration uh, and uh, meet exploit framework 2 and the web one and as I told you you may find that in many websites but since we have the tool inside back backtrack and it's very effective why not to use it <coughs> so once we open that we need to open a browser don't forget what we are getting right now is a, a payload to be used instead of sending those uh, D which is x44 so we're gonna go here and we are going to uh, write the IP mentioned 127.0.055 and we are going to go to the payload and feel free if you try that with a regular payload feel free to keep changing the payload just make sure you can like adjust the size and uh, so we can go to windows uh, windows uh, reverse shell you can take the meter you can get the bind shell and I can ask him to connect back to my computer on port 4444 uh, I'll keep everything the same way it is and then we're gonna create on generate payload and don't forget what do you need to check when it comes to the payload the size of the payload because after all the total size should be 2000 so we're gonna take this payload here you go sorry sorry okay so we're gonna take this payload and I'm gonna copy it and I'm gonna use that in my script uh, so uh, we can here write for instance this is a pay load or shell or 
anything you want payload and equal then you open this quotation and you paste okay and you close the quotation so this will be after or before the D. so here I'm gonna put pay load plus the remaining but what do I need to do next I need to remove those 312 from the 1015 so let's get back to the calculator and uh, let's see so it's 1015 minus 312 okay which is the payload size 703 don't forget the total amount should be 703 so I'll go here and I'm gonna type uh, I'm gonna remove that delete delete sorry delete 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 and we're gonna put seven zero three okay excellent now if you remember I told you also to make things more comfortable we used to put before the payload 19 null character remember those x90 this will allow him to like work probably instead of taking any risk so we can go here and we can add before the payload 16 character from x90 multiply and as I told you this is like a free space where it can be executed so you give him some freedom to execute plus the payload and what should we do next we need to remove those 16 one more time from the uh, remaining part so make sure that the total character will be 2000 so here we're gonna remove from here another 16 minus 16 equal 687 okay so here I'm gonna change that to 687 okay so uh, six eight seven okay just to be comfortable I need first to count the total amount and then one step remaining which you're gonna tell me about it so now we have six eight seven which is the remaining part plus 16 for the x90 plus 16 plus the shell code which is 312 plus four which is the EIP plus nine six five it should be two thousand okay so this should be right now everything is okay except if I send that right now yes the payload will be overwriting the ESP but except it will not be executed who will control the execute the EIP and what do we have in EIP here some meaningless word 42 42 42 42 so I need to change that to something that will enforce the ASP to be executed. And what will do that? If you remember the jump ESP. So we need to get from the Windows machine the code that will enforce jumping ESP. That whenever you put that inside the EIP, it will go to the ASP, see what is inside and make sure to jump on it. So I'm going to open immunity debugger and uh, we're going to associate it to the ability server. Ability server. Here you go. And we are going to attach. And uh, I need to go to the E the executable and I told you you can check for jump ESP or call ESP and usually they are inside user 32 or kernel those are Windows file so let's go here and let's uh, 
search for a comment search for a comment and type jump PSP and as you can see he was able to find the jump PSP let's see the jump PSP code is 7e429353 so uh, we'll try to use it there okay so going back here what was the jump PSE let me write it down first is 7 I'm gonna remove it because you cannot keep it this way I'm just gonna put uh, 42 uh, 9353 okay let me just double check nine three five three exactly okay now we need to write those jump psp inside the instead of the 42 okay and uh, also i want to remind you that when you write such code it should be written from back uh, because you know the something called the ending uh, ending architecture for intel so you should start from end to start so instead of this one i'm going to write 7e okay and here we're gonna write the 42 same way it is then we have 93 93 and then 53 so i wrote here jump psp that will allow us to execute the 53 let me remove it from here or even put like a hash okay uh, just to jump ESP okay so hopefully this will run the exploit but before running the exploit jump ESP uh, one point remaining which is what will happen when the exploit will run if everything went fine the victim should connect back to our machine but do we have a listening port on 4444 we don't so we before doing anything we need to open a terminal and and see it's exactly what we did on the previous scenario i'm just repeating that just to make sure that you understand the concept minus nvlp and the port number 4444 so port is listening now let's go to our victim machine and uh, close the immunity debugger run ability server and run the ftp and launch that and pray that it will work so here so it run nothing it run but we didn't receive anything mm -hmm. okay let me check my buffer okay nano ability it's a payload okay 16x90 payload 687 mm. okay let's see what is the situation there on the victim machine uh, because actually system should not be crashing it should just of be overwritten nano ability 
here you go it seems that something is happening minus nvlp nc minus nvlp 3 4 and let's try one more time ability server here you go and okay okay let me review the code and uh, let's see what went wrong I kept tracing the problem but I was not able to figure out what is the problem but it seems that it was related to the payload because I changed the payload to another payload as you can see so instead of using the windows reverse and this happened from time to time instead of using the windows reverse shell I choose the windows bind shell and windows bind shell it's uh, another uh, shell that will open a remote port on the machine 4444 and if I run that the payload size will change as well so as you can see what is the size of the payload is uh, Yeah, 344 so it's a little bit bigger than the previous one so I copied this one to the same file but I rename it because I was gonna keep trying on the previous file so I named the file nano uh, ability app 2 dot py so it's the exact same file except I changed the uh, payload and as you can see uh, okay sorry it's not this file control x so let's see uh okay nano two dot py just i wrote too many scripts so you know or i changed too many scripts uh, nope ls uh, oh, sorry my mistake inside the folder name bo and the file name was 2.py nano 2.py and you're gonna notice that is exact same script even the jump psp is the same and uh, 965 like the first one and then the eip and then 16 c 16 uh, 16 uh, uh, null uh, byte and then the shell code and the remaining was 682 so it's just a small modification but everything kept the same now this one it's not creating a reverse shell but it's opening on the victim machine port 4444 so I'm gonna need to go there and check that the port is closed and when I launch the exploit it should open so i can go to the machine and type net state minus a n o i'm sorry a n is enough and let's see if we have port 4444 open and as you can see we don't have any port 44 open so we're gonna run ability server now here you go and launch the exploit here you go sorry 
do, do to, uh, uh, two dot py and it launch and let's go now to the machine and let's see as you can see the system did not crash let's check the port net state minus a n sorry net state minus a n and let's see if we have port 44 open uh, yeah here you go so it work so not all payload will, will run with all vulnerability now okay we have a port 44 open on the machine what to do after that okay so i was able to open a port remotely we can use netcat netcat for the victim machine 192.168.0.0 seven dot I'm sorry nine five nine five dot one three seven and port four 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 and as you can see we get shell so the concept here was just to retry to simulate or retry the buffer overflow attack using another application real application and going through the same step again I would like you I'm going to share with you the script but I also I would like you to keep trying different payload try the meterpreter payload try the VNC which will give you a graphical uh, session on the vector machine full access graphical session so keep trying that but make sure that the exploit is well configured and as I keep saying by doing that now I have a f an exploit that can I can run on any machine that has ability server I just need to change the IP and it will give me full access on the machine so thank you and I, I hope those buffer overflow video is effective and please ma let me know if you have any question or if you need more demonstration thank you so much We did try different kind of buffer overflow attack. Actually, this is only one type of buffer overflow. Buffer overflow is a very big subject, but the objective of this section is to how to uh, was how to utilize the memory and how to get advantage of uh, from buffer overflow. And we went explaining a specific application, which was the Sikapom application. On this video, I'm going to just show you another application. I will not go step by step like previous video, but I'm going to show you the application. I'm going to show you the code, and I would like you to have a deep look on the code. I'm going to share uh, uh, the script, but I want you to use the same script we used before and uh, comp uh, customize it to be able to compromise the system. The application name with ability server. This is a, a server, some small software that you can install on your machine and it will transfer your machine to an FTP server or uh, uh, email server or uh, it has a lot of uh, function uh, email server, FTP server, uh, uh, different kind of services, HTTP so it can transfer your client machine to an HTTP server and browse pages or email or FTP and this specific version I believe it was 2.37 who's infected with buffer overflow. So if I install this application, I will share with you the link to be able to download this application. And I can create an account. I already created an account after the username FTP and password FTP. And I then I can activate, uh, I will activate the ability server. This application was infected with buffer overflow. So what happened is, I utilized the same script and I did create uh, or modify the script to be able to utilize this buffer overflow after testing it and you remember how to test an application by any fuzzer or you can check any website any security website searching for information about this application and I end up with this script that I want you to do the same but I want you to go st step by step using the primary script that I uploaded on the first video in this section 
So, sorry, uh, nano to dot Python, and this is the script. So I believe now if you watch or if you read the script, you'll be able to understand what is it. So the first one is the shell code. And then we have this value, and if you remember, this value is the jump ESP. And then we have the buffer has 965A, and then the jump ESP, and then 16C, and then 16 uh, null byte, and finally the shell code, and whatever remaining from the code, because total amount of buffer was 2000, not like a previous scenario 2000. And the only difference here in this script is that this application requests authentication. So you can see that we have a couple of lines here that you log in to this specific machine with this specific IP and specific port because FTP port on port 25. When you log in on this, to this machine that have this server, it will request username and password. So the next two steps will enter the username FTP and password FTP. So not necessarily that you need to have an account on this server to be able to compromise, but you are just studying the attack. So all the step is the same, except this application requests some uh, request and authentication. So two, two command here or two line are uh, related to the authentication part, entering the username FTP and uh, password FTP. And according to that, if we run the script, it should open port 4444 because I choose the Windows bind shell and I'll be able to connect. So before testing it, I want you to take your uh, task on this video. It's to take the primary script, which is this script. No, no. I'm going to upload the script with you, uh, to you, 1.py. Sorry. And this is a primary script. Same idea. It has just the basic one. And I want you to... Uh, customize that to be able to compromise to reach what I done but I want you to use the different uh, uh, shell code so you will not just copy and paste so try to go step by step following the previous video until you reach a stage where you can get a Windows reverse shell so just to make sure that my script is working if I just run the script And I open use NC because definitely a port or hopefully a port has been open 192.168.95.137 and port 4444 and here you go you have access to the machine so I hope buffer overflow is explained well to you and I want you to practice that very well because this is one of the like good skills that you should learn. And on the next video, which will be the last on the section, I'll give you a vulnerable application and I want you to do everything from A to Z. And if you have any problem, just submit your uh, uh, question on the discussion board. I'll reply back and even if it was not clear, I'll arrange for a remote session to guide you step by step. Thank you so much. Now, your assignment, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to go to this specific website. The link will be shared with you. So, to go to this specific website, and from this website, you'll be able to download an application called Vulnerable Server. And the Vulnerable Server, it's an application that is vulnerable for with buffer overflow. And you can download that from down here. Then you're going to write this vulnerable server from any virtual machine. And on this virtual machine, actually it's, it's a win, Windows application, so you can run it on a Windows application. <clears throat> from another machine, and you should do that from a Linux machine, backtrack machine, I want you to test this application if it's vulnerable. It opened port 666. 
346. So I want you to test if the application is vulnerable to buffer overflow using a fuzzing technique. If it's vulnerable, I want you to create a simple script that will allow you to compromise and get full access to the system using the buffer overflow. This will be your mission. I want you to try. If you were successful, please share your experience on our discussion board. And if not, please let me know. And if I get enough requests, I may do a video to solve this question for you. Thank you so much.